Well, friends, if you will uh, turn in your Bibles to page 1098, just some 32 years after your invasion. Uh, We're going to go, and there's an outline here, we're going to go very quickly, or I'm going to go very quickly through a a huge topic today. Uh, And that's the passage that I'll be referring to as must, if not more than most, though the text I'm actually speaking on is printed at the top of the outline in little print there called from Titus 2, our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealots for good works. Because today I actually want to talk about Jesus. He is our great God and Saviour. That is who Jesus Christ is. And he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealots for good works. For that's how the New Testament describes and understands Christians. Uh, Another parallel passage, for example, says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What's happening in Acts chapter 4 is that Peter is explaining a good work. A good work the Apostle Peter got into trouble with the authorities over. He had astonishingly crippled, uh, astonishingly healed a crippled man in the name of Jesus and was explaining to the crowd who gathered around this healed man, explaining how Jesus had healed him and that it was Jesus risen from the dead who had brought in this new age of resurrection when when the temple authorities took umbrage of what he had to say and his comments had him arrested and taken away. We pick it up, chapter 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. Here is the beginning of this real problem for them. But notice what upset the authorities. It wasn't that they were preaching Jesus' resurrection, but they were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection. You see it there in verse 2? Because they were proclaiming right at the end of the verse, in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. They were proclaiming, you see, the new age the age of the resurrection, the new creation when people would be raised from death to life, the new age of regeneration when people would be born again, that Jesus' death and resurrection was not some kind of one one of strange aberration, but the commencement of the judgment of the world, the commencement of the salvation of mankind, the commencement of the kingdom of God, the commencement of the messianic kingdom, with Jesus, God's Son, the Christ. This explanation that in Jesus was the new age, the resurrection, found its offensiveness for them. And it can be seen in Peter's statement if you go down to verse 8, just over the page. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, and said to them, rulers of the peoples and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, By what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, but which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Here is the Christian offence in the first century, which is equally offensive in the 21st century. The offence that the authorities wish to quieten, just as they wish it to be quietened today as well. Jesus' resurrection is God's seal that Jesus' death for sin has accomplished his purposes and in Jesus the resurrected new world order has commenced. So we see in verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name 
by which men must be saved. And that's why we've dated everything in the world as being BC, before Christ, or AD, Anno Domini, in the year of the Lord, and not AC, after Christ. We don't live before Christ and after Christ, which has a certain logic to it. We don't live like that because there is no after Christ. He's still alive. More than that, he is now ruling the world in the new creation, in the new age, in the resurrection. And Christians have been born again into this new age. We are God's workmanship, his new creation. Uh, remember the earlier quote I mentioned to you from Ephesians, it is, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Christians are now living in the new age, in the 2015th year of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we mean by AD 2015. And this exclusive claim offends people, for if it's right, then all else is wrong. All other religions, all other philosophies, all other ideologies are wrong and indeed stand under the judgment of God. The Sadducees of the first century who didn't believe in the resurrection found that profoundly offensive. The secularists of the 21st century who don't believe in the resurrection also find it profoundly offensive. And whenever people are in authority are offended by what is preached, their knee-jerk reaction is to suppress freedom, to suppress freedom of speech, to suppress freedom of religion. They don't check out whether it's true, they're just offended by the claim and seek to suppress its proclamation. That's what happened in chapter 4. They couldn't contend with the facts, for in verse 14 you see there is the healed man they wouldn't engage with the claims about Jesus and the resurrection. They were the ones who had him killed. So they censored and suppressed the preaching, as you read in verse 16, verse 16 following, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a noble sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in, this, in the name of Jesus. As the Old Testament says, there's nothing new under the sun. We see the same reaction all the way down history and is alive and well in our society today in Australia and yours in Britain. Our university secularists are insisting that students no longer write BC and AD, but the stupid alternative of BCE and CE. Uh, we don't live in the common era, but in Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. I call BCE, CE stupid because it is. <laughs> you do know I'm an Australian, don't you? You have got that idea? Not one of those eloquent Sri Lankan ones like you had last week, but one straight out of Sydney. It is. You see, there never has been a common era. The Jews' date today is 5,775 because they date from the time of Moses. The Muslims' date this year is, uh, is dated from the time of Mohammed, around 1,300, and I've forgotten the exact number. The Chinese date the year, we're in the year of the horse. There is no such thing as a common era. And the common era they use, why, it's the Christian one. It's based exactly the same numbers as before Christ and in the year of the Lord. This is just petty-minded academic prejudice. And it would be laughed off except it's part of the ongoing censorship on the universities of the Western world and the community around about us, and in particular the journalists and now the politicians, to censor Christianity out of our culture. And it's being imposed by authority. You get marked down in some universities if you write BC and AD. Already free speech and religious freedom has been undermined. It's been removed. You think you're the land of free speech? You're in cloud cuckoo land. You haven't had free speech in this country for years. It's similar of all Western culture. I'll illustrate it from England. 
Back in 1999, do you remember Glenn Hoddle, the manager of the English football side? He expressed thoroughly orthodox Hindu ideas, the belief in karma. Karma is the belief of, in just retribution and cause and effect, but it spreads across many lifestyles, lifetimes in reincarnation. So whatever you do will happen back to you, either in this lifetime or in the next lifetime or in the next lifetime as you're reincarnated. That is completely orthodox Hinduism. He expressed it about people with disabilities. It is reported, he said, and I'm not sure whether he did because I have absolutely no trust of journalists having been the victim of them over the last 15, 20 years. He is reported as having said, you and I have been physically given two hands and two legs and a half decent brains, but people have not been born like that for a reason. The karma is working from another lifetime. I have nothing to hide about that. It's not only people with disabilities. What you sow, you have to reap. You've got disabilities this lifetime? It's because you did something in the last. This message created a furor where not only disability groups, but even right to the Prime Minister of the day, he was attacked for this comment. A survey for the BBC showed some 90% of the population thought he should be sacked from his position as the manager of the English football team. In short time, he was sacked for it. It's a really a relatively clear case of the denial of freedom of speech. He said what he believed. Why isn't he allowed to say what he believes in the land of free speech? Because he said the wrong thing. We only give freedom to speak the things you're allowed to speak, not the things we don't like you speaking. And it's no freedom of religion. This is the land of free religion. Hindus not welcome. Hoddle pointed out to the way in which he was raising money and helping people with disabilities it made no difference. Public relations couldn't save him. Some people mentioned that his religious views had nothing to do with his capacity to manage a football team, which I would have thought was dumb obvious. But that made no difference either. You can't apparently be a Hindu football coach. Made no difference. His views were unacceptable. His sacking caused deep offence in India. Many of their newspapers came out in his defence, for they pointed out that it was anti-Hindu. But instead of dealing with Hinduism, our culture can't do that. Instead of pointing out the errors of its theology, its lack of factual evidence, its immoral race and caste system, instead of attacking Hinduism, which I'm glad to do any day of the week, no, we shoot the messenger. We stop him coaching football. Got nothing to do with it. We inclusively embrace Hindus into the community and criticise anybody who will speak against them like narrow-minded bigots, a la Philip Jensen, and then irrelevantly sack somebody when he expresses one of its core ideas and beliefs. What government authorities don't understand, and if they do understand they don't like, is the principle of civil disobedience. You see it here in Acts, with Peter's great statement in verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Governments don't like religion because a higher than the government, a higher authority than the government is a great threat to government. And people who are more loyal to their God than they are to the government cannot be controlled. And a people who are more moral than the government's criminal code undermine the government's power. Governments don't realise that a society without a higher authority than government is a society under a terrible threat of tyranny, however that government may have been appointed. Well, what can the government do? With people who place Islam ahead of England. For today, that's the problem, isn't it? The problem we're dealing with is Islamic terrorism. I'm not suggesting by calling it Islamic terrorism that all Muslims are terrorists, but all the terrorism I'm talking about now is from Islam. For by their own 
profession, the terrorists claim to act in the name of Islam. And we will not and we cannot understand them until we take their profession seriously. Until we listen to them and treat them with respect. They call themselves Muslims. They say they're doing it because of their Islamic belief. We must take them seriously about this. But the secularists who run our country can't. And they refuse to. You see, Islam of this nature does not practice freedom of religion. They don't believe in it, even in theory. We don't practice it in practice, but we believe it in, in theory. That's because Western civilization is totally hypocritical. They at least have the integrity of saying we don't believe in it and they practice unbelief in it. Which is at least consistent. It's standard Islamic teaching that a Muslim is not allowed to change his religion. Surveys in Egypt have shown up towards 90% believe that apostasy is a capital offence. To convert to Christianity is to put your life at risk, to put your life at risk of a death sentence given by government. That's not freedom of religion in any sense of the word. And it's not just the so-called ISIL extremists. That is standard Islamic teaching and practice across the Muslim world. Saudi Arabia, most of the Muslim countries won't allow Christians to preach the gospel publicly or to baptise Islam, Is, Islamic converts. It's just not allowed. It's against the law. You will be punished for doing it or deported at best. The recent bombings of Hebdo officers show that in Islam there is no such thing really as freedom of speech. We're being censored by their threats of violence. Stephen Fry and the BBC will attack Jesus and Christianity every day of the week, but they will not, and he does not attack Muhammad and Allah every day on the week for fear of reprisals. Oh, they say, no, we don't want to offend a minority group, as if Christians aren't a minority group. One level they say, no, no, we're not a Christian country anymore, we're just a, a multi-faith country with a Christian heritage, so therefore Christians are a minority, but now we're allowed to offend that minority, while we would never offend another minority like the ones who throw bombs at officers. Gutless is where they really are. That's the character of it. Many years ago I was uh, asked to be involved in a university prank of having Bible frisbees. And so I said, yeah, I'll collect up lots of old Bibles. You can frisbee them all you like, but I'm going to collect up Korans and I want you to frisbee them with the same... The whole program got stopped immediately. No one was willing to do a, a Koran frisbee. A Bible frisbee? Oh, the atheists love that. That would be good fun. A Koran frisbee? Gutless cowards. They wouldn't do it. You see, we're being censored, and we're censored by our own government and by our own society who claim they don't want to offend, but that's not really what it's about. Political correctness means causing offence is no longer acceptable. You see it in a constant censorship of Christian views and moral views. Uh, the moral objections to homosexual practices, for example, has come up with this new word homophobia. Uh, it's collected up with Islamophobia. I'm dead set against adultery. Does that make me an adulterophobe? What a stupid, ridiculous title they're giving. But once you're given that title, you see, you're not allowed to say. Any reason, any argument, any point of view you may have is not allowed. You're, you're a homophobic. You're adulterophobic. You're Islamic phobic. Shut up. Go in the corner. You're a naughty boy. Don't speak. The deeply offensive and crude cartoon, cartoons of Charlie Hebdo are being defended by the very same people who will not allow Christians to critique Islam for its false teaching and its immoral practices. We are suffering and will suffer more from the secularist explanation of the rise of Islamic terrorism as they try to dismiss the Islamic claims by sociology and psychology, saying really silly things like the young men going to fight are inadequate males, watching too much pornography, can't get a girlfriend so they go to fight. What a daft, stupid idea that is. Broadly, the secularists dismiss ISIL with two claims. One, religion causes war. Two, they are extremists, not mainstream Muslims. 
The causes of war, of course, are very complex. But this fantasy that religion causes wars needs to be buried with Voltaire and the children that he gave birth to who created the great bloodbath of the, uh, of the Napoleonic and the 20th century period. There are three reasons, quickly, why you get rid of the idea that religion causes war. One, it lumps all religions into the same bag. You see, what Christians teach is the same as Muslims, is the same as the Jews, is the same as Hindus. We don't, there is no one bag called religion. Two, in 2004, the BBC commissioned Bradford University Department of Peace Studies to report on the history of the contribution of religion to war, presumably expecting to make a really good show out of it. Check out the report, just go Bradford, uh, BBC, War, you'll see it produced a book, the bottom line of which is religion has rarely ever in the history of mankind been the cause of war. Once you actually look at the detail, thirdly, just do a common sense quick check for yourself. As I rattle through a few wars, just think to yourself, did religion cause it? World War I? World War II? The Korean War? The Malaysian insurgency? The Vietnam War? The African colonial and tribal wars, the Falklands wars. Religion wasn't involved in any of those bloodbaths of the 20th century. In fact, if anything, you could argue the atheists caused the wars. For it was atheism of communism in Russia and in China that butchered millions of people. And arguably, of course, Hitler's atheism was the factor that led to that huge bloodbath. The other main secularist explanation is the danger of extremists. This is a good politics and very bad policy. It's good politics because it's the political spirit. President Obama, he said of uh, the uh, Islamic State, it is neither Islamic nor a state. Very clever. This is the politics where you marginalise the opponents. They're not really Muslims. You label them unattractively. They're extremists. Who, who wants to sign up to be an extremist? You quieten the Muslims within your own community to stay loyal to the nation over the religion and you use the secular Muslims to, to, to still oppose ISIL. We don't want war here on our soil. Of course we don't. So we constantly refer to Islam positively. Oh, it's a religion of peace. Just check out where the wars are in the world at the moment and tell me that Islam is a religion of peace. We've got, they, they, they teach living in harmony with everybody. My friends, it may be a good political spin, but it's very bad policy because it's not based on the truth. It's a short-term pragmatism that will not in the long run defeat our enemy or create a just, rational or lasting peace. Islam is different to Christianity and it's not just the extremists but the faithful believers who are waging these wars in the Middle East today. Let me illustrate quickly, it's very simple. Look at Saudi Arabia, now that's one of our allies, that's a, a moderate in this kind of thing. In fact, they help us fighting uh, uh, IS. It's a thoroughly Muslim country. Look how Sharia law is applied in Saudi Arabia. They are at the moment in the progress of delivery, process of delivering a thousand lashes to one man. 20 times he is going through 50 lashes. He's also got a fine of 127,000 pounds and a 10 year prison term. His name is Raif Badawi. Why? Because he insulted Islam on his blog. Check out every Islamic state and you will find there is no freedom of religion in Islam and there is no freedom of speech in Islam. They don't exist. There is an unwanted and terrible violence in Islam. It's not the extremists, it's mainline genuine Islam taught and justified in the Quran and the Hadith. So let's return to genuine and mainland Christianity. Return to what the secularists would call extremist Christianity. See, the biblical explanation for wars is human sinfulness. We call what nations do, wars, but we also know that we war with each other. We war in domestic violence. We war in the divorce courts. We war with our neighbourhood disputes. We war in our family disputes. We war in the office and the politics. Because we don't have what we want, we are driven by envy and greed and covetousness and selfishness. We war. War is not something remote to human nature. 
War is something that is inherent in the sinful human heart. It's, it's part of our sinful lawlessness. But Jesus gave himself to redeem us from this lawlessness. So remember the extremist text with which I started. Our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. Jesus was an extremist. He laid down his life in self-sacrificial butchery of crucifixion. That's pretty extreme. He knew he was going to be killed and he still went to Jerusalem to die the death of humanity that we may be pardoned. And so we preach an extremist gospel that the secular society doesn't want to hear. And we're constantly being asked to tone down in multi faith denials of our own religious beliefs. But it's a matter of truth or falsehood, not of opinion and idea. Whether you want to believe and do what the government says is their business, but for me, it is God and his word that I must obey. It is the truth that must be preached. It's a matter of truth and falsehood, not a matter of opinion and idea. It's a matter of truth and falsehood. Did Jesus rise from the dead or didn't he? If he died for our sins and rode to life again, then all other religions are false. And he alone is our salvation. If he didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is false. And we're fools for believing in him. It's a matter of truth and lie, falsehood and right. It's not just a matter of opinion. So true Christians preach the resurrection. The same gospel and the apostles Peter preached. There is no salvation. There is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And this means the real Christians are extremists. Look again at my opening verse. Our great God and saviour Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. Two reasons. To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealots for good works. Christians are supposed to be zealots. Christians are supposed to be extremists. Christ purified us by his death in order that we would be zealots. That's what the text says. But notice the kind of zeal we're to have. The kind of zealotry that is Christian. The kind of zealots we are to be who are zealots for good works. There's nothing wrong with being an extremist. Nothing wrong with being a zealot. It all depends what you're extreme about. It all depends what your zeal is about. It's the object of zeal that makes it right or will make it wrong. See, I'm glad that William Wilberforce was a zealot fighting slave trade. I'm glad that the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury was a zealot fighting child exploitation, factory reform, mine, mining problems, chimneys, sweeps, Jewish resettlement. He fought against lunacy laws. I'm glad the man was a zealot. Our whole culture has been saved and purified and helped by his zeal by his zealotry. I'm glad that Martin Luther was a zealot for the truth and stood against the enormities and horrors of Rome in that period of time and stood for the truth of the gospel and Abel gave us Bible in our own language. I'm glad that Martin Luther was a zealot and I'm glad that his namesake Martin Luther King was a zealot who went to prison to fight the racism of Northern America and who was assassinated because of his belief. I'm glad for the zeal of that man. Nothing wrong with zealotry. We need more zealots. But the zealots we need are the zealots for good works. They're the ones we need. Don't mind being an extremist. Just be an extremist for good as opposed to an extremist for evil. So we thus thank God for such extremists purified by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ourselves should become zealots if we want to be his. Look down the end of it there and you'll see the little prayer that I pray often at the end of talks. <laughs> Have I got it there? Yes, it is there. The end of the outline there, you see. It's just the basic prayer you pray to become a Christian, but you'll notice in it is zeal. You'll notice in it that very verse I've been talking about. 
The acknowledgement that actually war is something we create, you know, we're guilty, we need forgiveness. It's not just them out there, it's us here. We, we're the problem. I'm the problem. And so we ask, we thank God for sending his son to die for me that I may be forgiven. And thank you that he rose me from the dead to give me a new life. And then I pray that God will not only forgive me, because I need forgiveness, but change me. How? Jesus is king of my life. That is extreme. But that is absolutely basic Christianity. If you're not an extremist Christian, you're not a Christian. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ and that he did give himself that we might be forgiven. Thank you that you raised him to new life, that we might be created again in his image to do the good works that you've prepared for us by your spirit please father give us such new birth that we will now live for our savior and call him our lord and we pray it in jesus name